Good afternoon everyone, my name is Jasper Helberg and on behalf of the entire Honors Quest team I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome. Together with my colleague Jocelyn, it's my honor to present you with the results of everything we have worked on for the past 22 weeks. I'd like to give you an especially wa warm welcome to Erik Puik and Rick Lafeber, representing the research group Microsystems Technology, who have trusted us with another exciting and challenging assignment. The same goes for, our for Bart and Dilko, our assessors. If any of you four have any questions or points you want to discuss, we will move to our meeting in Microsoft Teams after this presentation. For everyone else, feel free to use the chat on the right for any questions. A team member will answer them shortly. For now, I'd like to start with a quick recap of where we left off in our previous, previous presentation. Since our last presentation, 14 weeks have passed and we left you with quite the cliffhanger. We had just had our first couple of breakthroughs and we were on the brink of more. Last time, we discussed the following things. We had just significantly reduced the power consumption of the device by writing new low power software. We had designed an inventory management system that could keep track of the hundreds and hundreds of parts that we were going to need to complete 100 devices. We had three dev kits ready to assemble the e-paper hardware, uh, a testing dev kit for different antennas and for solar chargers. We had also just finished the design of two enclosure concepts that we were going to use for the final iteration of Ether. And we had started work on our sales funnel framework that we were going to use to guide customers through the purchase process and manage referrals between these customers. But most importantly, we had everything set up to start the production of 100 devices. And a large part of this project was devoted to that production process, mainly because of three reasons. First, we wanted to test out the production process to learn about any issues that would come up when scaling up the numbers. We wanted to validate the design internally to check whether the design we had made was actually as good as we thought and to maybe find improvements for the next iteration. And we wanted to start working with internal external partners. And that's something I'm going to talk about in a minute. Right when we were on the brink of production, we were forced into the lockdown. But luckily, due to the help of the research group, we were the first ones to enter the building eight weeks ago and production could commence. We started out pretty smoothly, mainly because of two things. We had already made all the fixtures that we were going to use during the production process before the lockdown and while we were stuck at home, we had taken the time to completely rewrite, rewrite our G-code to structure it into subprograms. And these subprograms allowed us to make small changes and tweaks to the program without changing the overall production process. And if you think that these two images, these two images look very similar, well, that is exactly the point. We had planned everything meticulously to make sure that as soon as we were allowed back into the building, we could start production. But even though we had planned everything, we ran into a few small issues, mainly with work holding. The fixtures I mentioned before, during the production process, slowly wore out while we were trying to push the machine to the limit. We had to slow down our G-code and some critical movements that generated high cutting forces in order to make sure that these work pieces were not pulled out of the machine during the machining process. Another issue were the sloppy tolerances in the outsourced PCB. We had specifically ordered ones that were one millimeter thick, but they turned, to be a, turned out to be 1.2 millimeters. This issue was solved by lowering the PCB position in the casing slightly in order to make space. Another issue was the mouse bytes as a result of the production process of the PCB that were on the side and needed to be hand filed off. The last issue was that the SD card holder was placed so far back in the on the PCB that it interfered with our casing and we had to machine a small notch in the wall in order to accommodate that. In the end, over a period of four weeks, we managed to make 125 casings, 200 lids and received 120 PCBs. And that's a lot more than the 100 devices we had promised at the beginning. And we made all these spare components for one reason. And that's because, well, yes, the fixtures are still there and the machine still works, but we think that 
this way of producing the, uh, the devices in-house is simply doesn't suffice. We think that the production limit is reached at about 100 devices, mainly because of four reasons. First off, 100 devices in four weeks isn't very much. It was very time consuming. It was very labor intensive. The unreliability of the fixtures increased over time, causing more and more problems to, to, be to, to arise during the production process. And if we're honest about it, the costs involved were simply unrealistic. We had free access to some very, very expensive machines, which is simply not comparable to any real-world production process. But to continue on a positive note, once the devi first devices came off the assembly line, we could start testing. And that's exactly what we did. In this first test, we tested Ether's battery life. We placed six devices in the field and had them send a LoRa message every four minutes, which is quite a lot, actually. We predicted that the battery life would be about six weeks, but after seven weeks, they were still going strong. The trend line you can see in red predicts that the batteries will run out in about a month, com combining to a total of about 10 weeks of battery life. But again, this is us really trying to get these batteries empty as quickly as possible. In a real world application where a message is sent every 20 or 30 minutes, we are talking about months and months of battery life. While these devices were out in the field, we calibrated the sensors of Ether using these testing devices. We have calibrated and tested every sensor that's on the device, but for the sake of time, I'll give you the example of the temperature sensors. In the white error bar you see on screen, that's the precision the manufacturer of the sensors guarantees. In practice, as you can see, Ether is way more precise, which is very, very good news. Next up, we tested our accuracy by comparing Ether to a calibrated temperature sensor we had borrowed from the energy lab. And again, just, within, just like on the previous slide, Ether is well within the margins. Again, very good news. So, at this point, in the previous semester, we had designed Ether and we had made some prototypes. We took it further this, season, this semester by optimizing the device, producing 100 pieces and testing them. And the next logical step is working with these external partners. And for that, we have designed the acquisition model method for collaboration and revenue, in short, the AMCR. And this method was designed to guide customers gradually through the acquisition process to establish these mutually beneficial partnerships that we are looking for. And this method has been derived from an existing model called the Sales Funnel Framework. And along the way, a customer needs to, pa needs to pass through the four gates that lead up to a deal. The AMCR uses the push and pull strategy to support customers in a reactive or proactive way, depending on whether they've approached us or vice versa. In the example I'm going to tell you about now, the research group New Energy in the City fulfills this role of lead user. The customer starts out unaware of Ether and its capabilities, but once awareness is created, they are invited for an exploratory meeting and move on into the second phase. In this suspect phase, insight into the customer's problem is gained using the 5W2H questionnaire, and the customer is informed about the Ether project in more detail. Once both parties have agreed on the functional requirements of Ether, the customer moves to phase three. The prospect phase is used to internally determine by our engineers whether Ether is actually a valid solution to the customer's problem. And for the research group, new energy in the city, this is very much the case. Because based on nothing but the specifications of six different anonymous sensor technolo technologies, a panel of 16 potential users clearly marked Ether as the right solution for this user case. At this point in the AMCR, the customer also decides whether they require a user interface to go along with the hardware. My colleague's going to tell you a lot more about that. Afterwards, they are presented with a quotation and the collaboration agreement. And once they've signed both of those, the customer moves on to the deal phase. At this point, payment is made. 
And once the devices have been delivered and the user interface has been presented, explained and tweaked to the customer's needs, the customer moves into the final phase. And at this point, if the customer needs anything changed or wants more devices, they move back into phase four. If the customer needs more devices for a different purpose or refers either to someone else, this new customer is put back into the AMCR in phase two. The bowling alley is used to gain insight into how these new customers are related to each other. Because once the first customer has been fully satisfied, others will follow. To make sure customers can easily show the Ether project to colleagues and acquaintances, we have shot a short promotional video. And I'm going to ask our director now to play the video and afterwards my colleague Jocelyn is going to tell you some very exciting news about the next generation of Ether. Thank you. Nowadays, collecting data is a key part for process optimization, sustainability, and living comfort. Every problem can be solved by measuring the right variables. By measuring movement in nine degrees of freedom, light intensity, temperature, air pressure, and relative humidity, Ether proves to be a great solution. Applications are endless due to the long battery life, connection over LoRa, and waterproof enclosure. Ether is being developed by a team of students from multiple engineering studies supported by the Research Group Microsystems Technology. In the first year, we have designed and manufactured the first prototype, of which 100 have been produced for the design's validation and optimization. The production process has been redesigned to be quick and affordable by combining laser cutting, water jet cutting, and CNC milling. After manual assembly, the devices were tested in a controlled lab environment using the scientific equipment available. The collected data has been processed and analyzed to determine the accuracy and precision of ether sensor measurements. In order to continue measuring over a period of months instead of weeks, the software was further developed to increase battery life to a minimum of two months and up to a year. This allows Ether to be placed in various environments to collect the necessary data without the need to charge the battery. In order to view and gain new insights into your collected data, a dashboard is provided where the collected data is visualized. This dashboard is a multi-platform application allowing data to be viewed from a smartphone, tablet, or web browser. Easily set up a custom new environment and turn push notifications on and off with the press of a button. Does Ether need to measure something else? New software can be easily uploaded via a USB connection. We are constantly looking for new opportunities to develop Ether further by putting as many Ethers out into the world as possible. We will help you implement Ether according to your needs and the problems you wish to solve. At the same time, you will financially support the Ether project and provide feedback, giving us the chance to continually improve Ether. Can we count on you? Okay, thank you, Jasper. As he introduced me as, my name is Jocelyn. And as he mentioned, I'm gonna tell you something about the user interface. You've seen it come by a few times in the video we just saw. The user interface is that which makes Ether's data usable for our end user. Last, in the last previous project from last semester, we ended off with a Cayenne platform, which is a free to use data dashboard that was fairly limited in its use. For that reason, we decided to develop our own dashboard for this semester, the result of which you see behind me right here. This is the home page. On the home page, you see each Ether device that is in use uh, viewed in a tiling system. This dashboard has been designed with user friendliness and simplicity in mind. First, I will demonstrate how we add a new Ether to a new room, which can be done from the top right corner over there. We create a new room. We enter a name for this environment that we're putting Ether in. We link it to its unique device ID. We hit save. And then it appears on our homepage overview. Side note, this dashboard is now viewed in Dutch, but depending on your browser settings, uh, it directly translates the Mendix dashboard into English, making it versatile for both Dutch and English users. Moving on, this dashboard also uh, is equipped with a settings and configuration page. 
up there in the top right corner, where the user can turn on and off push notifications at will, as well as delete previous environments and rooms that are no longer needed. Moving on, we go on to one of our measuring devices. I'm now going to show you uh, the data collected by one of our ethers right here in this room that we're in. This is where the general data is viewed. We see the current measurements, uh, relative humidity, temperature, as well as the air pressure. Scrolling down a bit, we have a few graphs that depict this data in a very clear and concise way. Through these graphs, we can zoom in on the data. To get a more detailed overview of the device's data, not only can this dashboard be viewed from a web browser, it is also available on smartphone, as you can see right here. And now we're moving back onto the presentation, because this is not the only uh, thing we developed this semester. We also developed, uh, we're also working on the next generation of Ether. As Jasper mentioned before, it was part of our de uh, assignment description. For this end, we were tasked with adding additional features to the device's design. In order to reliably implement these features, three PCBs were designed for testing. These are the antenna, e-paper, solar development kits, as we call them, of which the designs were presented at the previous presentation, as you saw in the recap. During this presentation, we will now present the results of these tests and how it influenced the final design. Starting off with the PCB antenna dev kit, one of the requirements was improving the signal strength of the LoRa antenna by replacing the previous antenna with a PCB antenna. For this purpose, a PCB was designed with which a selection of PCB antennas could be compared with one another, as well as the antenna from our previous design. So up here, you see the four PCB antennas that we have selected, of which the performance we tested using the spectrum analyzer, which you can see to my left over here. The spectrum analyzer displays a peak at the frequency band the signal was sent over, the amplitude of which is a measurement of the signal's power ratio in dBm, which gives an indication of the transmitted power and thereby the performance of the antenna itself. These were the results of the antenna tests displayed in this chart to my left. The closer the values to zero are, the better the antenna performance. The green bar you see to the right shows the performance from the previous ether an Ether's antenna, which is over here. Only two PCB antennas appear to be an improvement over our old stick antenna. Those are the Antonova PCB antenna to the top left, and indicated by the white bar, and the Johansson antenna, which is on the top right, indicated by the yellow bar. Given that their signal strength are similar, the Johnson was chosen seeing as it's half the price of the Antonova antenna and the placement of it is far more flexible. One of the requirements was also to add a display in order to give direct feedback to the user. That's the reason this PCB was developed, to test the schematics from the data sheet provided by WaveShare in order to gain a clear understanding of the electronic hardware behind driving an e-paper display as proof of principle. Furthermore, the problem owner wanted a replacement functionality for if a client didn't want an ether with a display. Instead, the device would be equipped with solar panels to make it more energy efficient and extend battery life. Just like with the antenna dev kit, a selection of solar charger ICs, three in total, were found and compared with one another. Since ether will mostly be used indoors, they were selected based on the ability to charge in low light conditions. The ones we ended up choosing were the BQ05, BQ70, and AEMS. The best in all four categories turned out to be the one indicated in blue, which was the BQ05. This graph shows the charge current produced by our selected BQ05 solar charger in three scenarios, under indoor light, under indirect indoor light, and mounted vertically on a wall, also exposed indoor light. As you can see, the charge, charge current ranges from 30 to around 55 microamps. These results are promising for extended battery life of our device since it consumes under 100 microamps in sleep, reducing power consumption by 30 to 50%. That concludes the R&D that went into the functionality of the new design. 
I will now illustrate the design phase results of the enclosure for this device. As mentioned before, we were challenged with designing a device that can accommodate a display or a solar panel. This means the enclosure has to be designed to uh, fit both. During the design phase, three different concepts were developed. The first two were presented 10 weeks ago. Those are the top two over here. And the third has been newly developed since then. Starting off with concept one. It's very thin at just 8.1 millimeters. It's large in surface area, allowing for more surface area for PCB components. From the cross-section view, you can see how the midsection is solid plastic with a glass panel at the top and bottom. However, due to the relatively thin walls of this concept, it's not very rigid and could be prone to breaking when under pressure. With concept two, the issue of rigidity is solved with the curved sides of the enclosure, allowing pressure to be more evenly distributed throughout its structure. Here too, the midsection is solid plastic, with a glass pane at the top and bottom. This concept is also easier to produce due to the vent holes, which are those three dots over there, being on the side of the uh, enclosure instead of directly inserted at the top. Where concept one was thin at 8.1 millimeters, concept two is slightly thicker at 10.0 millimeters. This is the newest concept. It has been designed to be as small as possible and as discreet as possible. It's shape being derived from an Apple watch. Contrary to the previous concepts, the midsection and bottom are made from solid plastic with a single glass panel placed on top. This improves its producibility given that there are now less parts to put together. However, due to its small form factor, the PCB would naturally be somewhat smaller in surface area and this would negatively affect antenna performance. Each concept brought with it new insights and possibilities. The best features from all three of the concepts being shape, rigidity, and rounded structures, rounded edges, were combined into what you see before you, the final design of the next generation of Ether. In order to scale up production of this device, production of the enclosure was one of the limiting factors as we've stated at the beginning of this presentation. Manufacturing more than 100 devices using the facilities we have here and using previous methods is simply not viable. The solution to this problem is injection molding. For this reason, the enclosure was designed to be produced using a simple three-part mold. This animation shows the process of injection molding for this design through simulation, the results of which were very promising. A rough PCB layout to fit the casing was produced. Placement of certain components was critical for the design. The rest of the components were added around and PCB routing could begin. Now I'll go into the final PCB design. The placement of the light sensor and the temperature, humidity, and air pressure sensor, which is called the BME280 for us, is placed on the left-hand side of the USB connector. The connector for the e-paper display has been put squarely in the middle. The PCB antenna placement is at the top left. That spot was chosen so that if an e-paper display is mounted onto the device, the antenna looks directly past it reducing electromagnetic interference. Up here is the Murata chip, the brain of the device as we call it. It contains the microcontroller and the lower radio transceiver. Above the Murata chip, we have the solar panel inputs. Over here is a new addition to our design, a flash memory integrated circuit, which replaces the micro SD card storage from our previous design for cheaper and more efficient data storage. Two LEDs at the right side of the USB connector, one for charging or one to indicate when the device is charging and the other can be user controlled through software. Here we see presented the fully assembled next generation of Ether, of which there are two variants, each with its own name, Ether Inc and Ether Solar. The device is small, being only 50 by 43 millimeters, and 8.9 millimeters high. To give you an indication of how small it actually is, I have one right here with me. 
here it is. You can see the measurements on the screen. When I reset the device, we see it flash briefly. The screen refreshes. The Ether logo is displayed. And it takes new measurements and updates the screen. Fun fact, the measured data we showed you earlier in the presentation actually came from this very device, proving not only that its sensors work, but also that it can send this data to the internet using LoRa. As mentioned before, the light sensor and feedback LEDs are placed at either side of the USB connector. The top glass has a silk screen surrounding the solar panels, an e-paper display with two circular windows for the light sensor and LEDs to receive or transmit light from, as well as ventilation holes to the side over there, on the left side of the USB connector, where a membrane is fixed onto for the air to reach the temperature, humidity, and air pressure sensor without compromising its IPX7 water resistance rating. That was the end of our presentation. It's been a year of passion, hard work, and the occasional Nerf gun fight. We're proud of our result, and we hope that showed during this presentation. To everyone who has received a Teams meeting link from us, we'll see you all there for the discussion. For our other viewers, thank you so much for watching until the end. If you have any questions about the project, feel free to post them in the chat, and someone from the team will answer it when we return. Furthermore, if you have any burning questions that you want to reach out to us through official accounts, you can do so at email uh, ether at who.nl. You can send us an email. And you can also follow our LinkedIn page, the QR code being right there. Thank you very much.